Marian Bracha is the director of uh, the LLM in trial advocacy and a pract uh, practice professor of law at Temple University Beasley School of Law. She is an accomplished litigator who served as an assistant direct district attorney in the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office from 2006 to 2018. In addition to serving as a trial attorney in major trials and the family violence and sexual assault unit in uh, 2012, Professor Bracha uh, was appointed to a supervisory position in the district attorney's charging unit and in 2014 launched Philadelphia's domestic violence diversion program. She frequent, uh, presents frequently on gender bias in the courtroom, uh, particularly as it impacts transgender and gender diverse people and cisgender women. We are privileged to have her with us this evening to present on the topic of eliminating gendered communication in the practice of law. Thank you, Professor Bracha. All right, thank you. Um, may I ask uh, one of the admins to enable screen share so that I can pull up my PowerPoint? Yes, uh, let me do that now. Okay, you should be able to now. All right. All right, great, thank you so much. Um, I should be sharing my title screen that has hysterical on it with a lady on a fainting couch. Can I get a, a thumbs up or um, a verbal that everyone can see what I'm seeing? Yep, yes. it's up. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so thanks thanks so much to Queen's Bench for having me and, and thanks so much for your very kind introduction. I wanna thank especially one of the um, participants that I see here, Kaylin Romy, it was a pleasure to work with her. She was a, uh, a, a guest presenter and instructor for the LLM program just a couple of weeks ago for our depositions program. And it was through uh, working with, with her to, to prepare that deposition program that um, she told me about Queen's Bench and, and put the wheels in motion to invite me tonight. So I, I just am very grateful to her for, um, for the introduction and for, and for proposing this topic, which I think is an important topic. Um, so I, I want to start basically in, in the description or the subtitle of this presentation that, that I've given um, around the country in, in numerous uh, ways and various formats. Um, the, it, the subtitle is Gendered Communication and its Effect on Persuasive Advocacy. It's morphed into how we can eliminate that gendered um, gender bias uh, due to our language choice and our communication style, but um, our, the, the, the title, the lead word is hysterical. And the reason that I call this presentation hysterical is because everyone has that word. Everyone has um, that dig or that slight, if you will, that is, is, is like nails down a chalkboard. It's basically the thing that puts us in, in, in a fighting kind of mood, if you will. Um, so let's start with a definitional section because etymology is important when we understand words and, and words impact. So hysterical comes from the Latin word hysterica, which means of the womb. Hysteria was a condition thought to be exclusive to women, which would send them uncontrollably and, and neurotically insane, owing to a dysfunction of the uterus, the removal of which is still called a hysterectomy. Um, another word that has gendered roots is a word that's pretty colloquial and pretty simple. Loony. You're loony. You're crazy. Or put them in the loony bin. Loony comes from lunacy, which is a monthly periodic insanity believed to be triggered by the moon cycle. Remind you of anything. Um, words matter. Words count. And these etymologies have led to and cemented the polarization of the male and female mental states. Male, men being historically associated with rationality, straightforwardness, logic, and women with unpredictable emotions, outbursts, even madness. So in terms of this particular presentation and the research that I've been doing for about the past four years um, into gendered communication, and this is something I intend to write next semester, I'm going to spend um, the bulk of the spring semester writing this, um, this came because of an in-class discussion that I had with my LLM students. And I'm sure that many of you know that the 
an LLM program is a post JD graduate program. Uh, the program that I direct for Temple University Beasley School of Law is the, the LLM in trial advocacy. So I have practicing attorneys from all over the country who come into Philadelphia several times a year for performance components. And about, oh gosh, now it's what, four years ago in the summer of 2019, I had a um, an in-class discussion with a friend and colleague whose name is Scott Gratz and is a double PhD. His first PhD is in communication, his second PhD is in art history. And we were having this, this discussion with our master's students, our master's candidates at the time, um, about upspeak. Someone had, had made a statement but employed upspeak. And upspeak is when um, a, a sentence, a statement is made declaratively, but the voice lilts at the end of the of the declarative sentence and and the sentence sounds like it ends with a question mark it sounds like it ends in an interrogatory um and th this led to this really productive and fruitful discussion that has that has now guided four years of research into the fact that there are different perceptions and interpretations of when a man says something versus when a woman says the exact same thing, oftentimes in the exact same tone or pitch or pace or register. Um, and so we've all heard the phrase, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. But really, when it comes to gendered communication, it's who's saying it, who's the mouthpiece, who's delivering the message. In that same, and, and, I, and I will say, what the conversation revealed was that when men use upspeak, um, uh, for instance, so you're you're doing a presentation tonight, right? That's a sentence. That's a statement. It should end in a period, but the voice lilts at the end. The perception oftentimes is that when a male a man uses upspeak or a person who identifies as male uses upspeak and lilts at the end of a sentence, it's perceived as being condescending, as being arrogant, as being a know-it-all. Conversely, when a woman or a person who identifies as female uses upspeak, the perception is that she is lacking in competence, lacking in confidence, um, and 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 all around not as effective as uh, uh, someone using the male register with that same intonation. So our perceptions and reception to messages is very different based on the deliverer of the communication. But should it be uh, in that same class, in that same discussion? I had a student, and I tell this story with his permission. I had a student who is um, Japanese by ethnicity, born in New York, raised pretty much everywhere else, but has spent a lot of his professional career as in-house counsel for a corporation based in Japan, and so has lived and worked um, uh, almost almost exclusively in Japan. And so we were doing. Um, an advocacy exercise. He was either direct or cross-examining a witness, and and he was uh, being objected to and answering objections. And whenever the judge would render a ruling, this student of mine would say, "Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Judge." Um, and I am a very East Coast practitioner and communicator. You may have already noticed. And um, so I, I cut off this student and I said, "Don't don't thank the judge. Don't do that." Don't thank the judge. The, the judge just sustained an objection against you. He's eliminating really important information from your case. He's tanking your case, and you're thanking him. It sounds insincere. It sounds sycophantic. It sounds like, thank you, ma'am, may I have another? Um, don't thank the judge, especially when the ruling is not in your favor. And this student came to me afterwards, and this was an eye-opening conversation for me. And he said, but, Professor, you don't understand. I'm way too Japanese to not thank the judge. I can't not thank the judge. And it dawned on me in that moment that I was asking this male student to sacrifice a part of his cultural identity, to adopt and to adapt to my expectation of what an East Coast, mid-Atlantic, aggressive, slick-tongued male litigator should be. And so I was doing to him what, by and large, our male opposing counsel and male judges have done to female members of the bar for about the past hundred years, when we're lucky enough to present in front of them. Uh, and so that's where this 
research came from and, and the inception of it. Um, and what do we tell our students when they're starting out in the, in the practice of law or when they're just learning advocacy techniques? We tell our students, know thy forum. And that's really what gendered communication is. We are telling our students to adopt and adapt uh, to the cultural expectations that have been unfairly laid upon us. But is it just the advocates who present and identify as female that are adapting and adopting? Is there as great a need or as strenuous an effort for male advocates to adapt and adopt? And if they don't, does it affect their success in the courtroom or in the boardroom or their persuasiveness? And so are we doing any service to our female advocates by telling them to know thy forum or are we reinforcing this sexist, misogynist paradigm in which we practice? So before I go on and talk and give a little bit more background and definitions of gendered communication, I do want to offer something of a disclaimer, which is that I recognize that this is a simplistic view of gender identity and orientation. I also recognize that the numbers I'm, I'm going to show you in terms of the women's experiences in the legal profession are far worse for minority women, LGB women, trans women, women with disabilities. I'm presenting something of a simplified view of these experiences because, but I do recognize that the challenges are exponentially greater for advocates who aren't white, straight, and cisgender. All communication is gendered, and gendered communication is not just a phenomenon in the law. Gendered communication is rooted in our sociology, our psychology, our anthropology, and our history. And Certainly, it is not rooted in our biology. Communication is not inherent or unchanging. Um, but change is hard in a societal and professional context. Tim Johnson and Brian Black and Justin Wedekin wrote an astounding, did an astounding empirical analysis of Supreme Court justice behavior um, during oral arguments. And they wrote that all, gen all of language is gendered. Men assert themselves more linguistically because they need not fear giving offense. Women's language developed as a way of surviving, even flourishing, without control over economic, physical, or social reality. Andy Tazlitz also wrote a book called Rape and the Culture of the Courtroom. He's actually a former prosecutor in Philadelphia County. We did not overlap at the office, but I'm, I'm very proud that he's also an alum of the office that raised me. And, and he wrote in Rape and Culture of the Courtroom, men are taught to view language as a tool, indeed a weapon, to obtain desired goals. For many among them, this competitive adversarial use of language is second nature. Not so for most women who are taught to use language to build relationships, strengthen emotional bonds, and mediate disputes. On average, men are socialized to be both more practiced at and pleased with linguistic combat than women. So bias based on gendered communication has an extraordinarily disparate impact on women attempting to achieve parity in male-dominated professions like the law. And this is such a problem in the law because language and the practice of law are, as I'm sure you know, inextricably linked. Communication skills are the number one reason people advance or don't in the legal profession. So when I'm referring to things like women speak or men speak or the female register or the male register, what am I talking about? Well, women speak is more associated with indirect language, a affiliative language, affiliative speech uses verbal cues that affirm the speaker's connection to the listener. Things like using praise, reflective comments, probing questions, and displays of support. Um, men speak, on the other hand, is much more direct, much more assertive. Men use imperative sentences, whereas women tend to use uh, declarative sentences or interrogatory forms. Women also have a tendency to use adverbs far more frequently than men do. Um, the most frequent adverbs that women use are the words really, maybe, and to, T-O-O. -O. Um, women, uh, men also use direct verb usage, whereas women use conditional verb usage. Things that are attached to the word would or could, if you wouldn't mind, if I might ask you a question, um, if I may, uh, things like that. Women, uh, women speak or the female register is also associated with being hyper polite um, and with hedges. Hedges are things like I guess 
or it seems like, or maybe we could say, um, and those hyper polite words like, forgive me, excuse me, so sorry to interrupt, but if I could, it is if I could interrupt, if I could ask, thank you, thank you for answering my question. Um, and men speak or the male register primarily, predominantly, no, we don't see any of that or much of that hyper polite or hyper polite language or hedging talk. Um, yes, this happens both in written and oral communication. Women also use emotional and cognitive words much more than men do. Emotional Examples of emotional words would be words like brave or cry, relief, safe. Cognitive words are things like I, I believe or I think, um, whereas men <clears throat> do not attach those qualifiers to those statements typically. There's your citation um, for this study between women's speak and men's speak or the female register and the men's register. So tonight we'll examine the reality of life and practice for female attorneys by the numbers. I'm sure that none of this is going to be a surprise to you. And then we'll talk about ways to shift this paradigm in our courtrooms and our conference rooms and in our legal interactions. But before we get to the effect of perceived gender identity on the persuasiveness of our advocacy, I do want to quickly examine what the experience is for women in law. And unfortunately, it sucks. Law was one of the last professions to admit women, as the Steen bench is aware. And even though it's been about 100 years since all the states admitted women to the bar, until the 1960s, female law grads were relegated to jobs as stenographers, for librarians and law libraries. So change in the profession has happened, but it's been incredibly slow. Currently, women are about 54% of law school graduates, but women fall far behind their male counterparts in markers of success in the profession, according to Emily Klein, who just published an incredible article um, this past summer in the UCLA Women's Law Journal. So let's take a look at um, how women are falling behind in terms of the markers of success. I want you to pay attention more to the bottom portion of this graph, which shows the increase in the percentage of female representation in the practice of law. So of course, I'm very happy to see that upward trend in the percentage of American lawyers who are women. That's great. And we'll eventually catch up to the gray line, which, which means that we will have achieved parity in terms of representation between the genders in, um, in the legal profession. However, here's what's problematic. Even though women's uh, participation and representation in the legal profession is steadily increasing, um, our representation in leadership roles in the law and, um, and in certain wealth positions in terms of equity partnerships and shareholder partnerships has remained basically stagnant over the past um, more than more than 15 years. Um, women are about 40% of all attorneys at law firms and about 37% of all attorneys across the profession, but we still represent less than a quarter of equity partners. And despite the overall increase in percentage of female lawyers nationwide, the percentage of equity and non-equity partners stagnates somewhere between 20 and 20% and, and the high 20s if we're talking about non-equity partnerships. You can take a look at a slightly longer uh, time frame here. So between 20, 2006 and 2015, again, the percentage of female attorneys increased nationwide by about 14%. That's a big jump. But women's share of equity partnerships where the highest compensation and leadership positions are lodged remains at 20% and has not changed in recent years. In 2022, women of color made up 20% of 1L of first year law students, but they represent only 9% of attorneys who are barred and in practice, 4% of all partners and 3% of equity partners. And the results were identical in 2019. They did not increase at all in those three years. Break those numbers down a little further and 0.9%, less than 1% of all law firm partners are African-American women. 1% are Hispanic or Latinx women. And 1.8% are Asian-American women. The overall demographics, these are our most recent stats from 2020. So again, as I said, we, are, we represent 40% of all lawyers in the United States. That's up from 37% in 2019. But Again, we still make up 31% of non-equity partners. That's not parity. 21% of equity partners. 
where the highest paid positions are lodged. Um, now we will eventually. I know you're saying, okay, but there's there's got to be some um, some some progress, and it's happening. At least the numbers are increasing. Yes, you're absolutely right. So I will chill and I will slow my roll and say, sure, parity is coming in terms of equity partnerships and leadership positions, and we will eventually achieve parity. But at the current rate of promotion, we will achieve. And I apologize if you hear noise from outside. I am still. Um, in my office, and I'm uh, in North Philadelphia on Temple campus, and it is noisy outside on an undergrad campus. So we will eventually achieve parity in terms of leadership position at the current rate by 2181. So that's not promising to me. Um, and that is rather disappointing, especially given our growth in terms of representation in the profession as a whole. But gee, how about the gender wage gap. We're closing that, right? Let's see. In 2010, female partners earned an average of 24% less than male partners. It got better towards the end of the decade, didn't it? No. In 2018, female partners were earning an average of 35% less than male partners. Average male partners' compensation grew 42% in that time period, while female partners' compensation grew 22% in that time period. Um, and I, I don't have a slide on this, but I'll tell you the stats on it, which are um, really disturbing. There is also a weight bias. Women with a higher BMI, a body mass index, tend to earn even less um, than their male counterparts who also have an elevated BMI. These penalties have not only increased over the past few decades, but they continue to increase as women age. Men do not seem to face a similar weight bias. In fact, some studies found that white males who are seen as overweight actually earn even more than their male counterparts who have a normal BMI. Um, the wage penalty for women who are seen as overweight is consistent in every study that's been published. Um, the, and, and, and again, that weight um, penalty exacerbates the older that women get. So. Um, as a woman ages, the effect of her weight on her wealth gets worse. Um, there was a study that the National Institute of Health put out uh, that found that the financial net worth of a moderately to severely obese woman aged 51 to 61 was 40% lower than that of a normal uh, of her normal weight peers. And in that same cohort of women, their net worth fell even more to 60% of their counterparts when they were between 57 and 67 years of age. So the older women get, um, even if their uh, above average BMI remains the same, the more they are punished on the, on the wage end on, in terms of their earning uh, potential. But it's not just about money or prestige. Women also have less access to prime assignments and to speaking roles in courts, and that's across the board. That's not just in big law. So the study that you see there on the left analyzed the gender breakdown of attorneys appearing in speaking roles at every level and in every type of court in New York State. Women are lead counsel in only 25% of cases across New York State, and that's considering upstate, downstate, federal and state courts, trial and appellate courts, criminal and civil and ex parte applications, and in multi-party matters. Um, there was a consistent finding about 10 years ago in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Illinois, 33% of lawyers um, appearing as lead counsel in criminal cases were women, and 24% of lead counsel in civil cases were women. 24% a quarter in civil cases were women. In complex commercial cases, the numbers are even worse. Women's representation as lead counsel shrinks with the, um, the, the greater the number of parties. So. 31% for one party cases, all the way down to below 20% in cases with five or more parties. I guess that's because our female, our feeble little female minds just can't handle these complex matters. It's either that or those in leadership positions don't trust us to handle them. How about the judiciary? I had to consider these numbers and I said, gee, you know, many jurisdictions have um, uh, public elections for judicial positions, so maybe just maybe we're closer to parity when it comes to the judiciary. Let's look at the state. 34% um, of state court judges are female. Then I said, well, there's been lots, dozens of uh, scores, perhaps, 
of um, of judicial um, appointees, nominees and appointees given since the Biden administration. And this is not a political statement. This is math. 75% of Biden's uh, judicial nominees have been female. So I thought to myself, geez, the federal judiciary numbers have to be better or improving. And they're not. They're, they're even worse than the state. Women make up 28% of the federal, federal judiciary. And Congress is just as ugly. This is the most diverse Congress in the history of the United States. And women comprise 28% of it. 29% of the House of Representatives and 25% of the Senate. It's weird. It's almost like there's this invisible barrier that is holding these numbers stagnant um, and certainly nowhere near parity, but somewhere in the, that 20 percentile range. But it's not just law. This article was put out by the New York Times last March um, indicating that uh, women and people of color are twice as likely as men to be diagnosed with a mental illness when their symptoms are just as consistent with heart disease. Why? Because it's all in our heads. We're crazy. We're hysterical. Patients who have felt that their symptoms were inappropriately dismissed as minor or primarily psychological by doctors are using the term medical gaslighting to describe these experiences. Studies have also shown that compared with men, women face longer waits to be diagnosed with cancer and heart disease, and they are treated less aggressively for traumatic brain injuries. They're also less likely to be offered pain medication. People of color often receive poorer quality of care, too, and doctors are more likely to describe Black patients as uncooperative or noncompliant, which research suggests can also affect treatment quality. This was a massive study put out by Forbes and the ABA um, that found that um, female lawyers, and particularly those who are minorities, are more likely than their male counterparts to be mistaken for non-lawyers, including custodial staff, um, to do more office housework, housework, such as meeting scheduling and party planning, and to have less access to crime assignments, which we spoke about, and to be interrupted. So that's a significant um, portion of the research that I have in this presentation that I want to talk to you about. I want to tell you one story, though, if I may, about the, the first bullet point there. Um, in the class of 2021, I had a brilliant student, a brilliant master's in trial advocacy student who was um, a prosecutor. And she was, what for the time that she was in our master's program, she was assigned to the juvenile unit at the DA's office, meaning that um, she was uh, primarily handling uh, uh, crimes and prosecuting crimes that were perpetrated against children by adult perpetrators. Now, in Philadelphia, that specialized courtroom sits in family court. So it sits in the same building where dependency matters are held and support matters are held in custody and things like that. Um, so my student walked into court with her suit, with her trial bag, in heels. This is a, a brilliant litigator, someone who suffers no fools and, and um, kicks lots of butt and takes names. And she rolled her trial bag up to counsel table. She was unloading her files onto the table. She had her, her red well full of files for the day. And court staff said to her, and I, I should also mention, this is an African-American female. And court staff motioned to her and said, ma'am, ma'am, if you're here for vis visitation, that's down on the third floor. So that one story, and she was taken aback. And that affected her performance that day in court because just that mistake um, of confusing her for a non-lawyer, even though every indication was that she was there to prosecute cases cases that day, affected her performance. Um, and, and that happens daily and that happens constantly. And I'm sure that there are people in the CLE um, who can relate to that. So I, I want to talk about interruptions because this is a significant portion of our um, of, of what happens in between the female register and the male register. Research suggests that interruptions are attempts by speakers to maximize their power positions in group settings through assertions of dominance. And so it follows that studies analyzing power dynamics between the genders often include discussions of, ge of interruptions because interruptions are a violation of a current speaker's right to complete a term. 
I have to tell you a fun fact about interruptions. This comes from Mary Beard in her book, Women in Power, a Manifesto, which is a, a really quick read, but super interesting. And Mary Beard reminds us that of the first recorded example of a man telling a woman to shut up in Western literature and telling her that her voice was not to be heard in public. And that first occasion was in Homer's Odyssey almost 3,000 years ago. So as you probably know, the Odyssey is the story of Odysseus, who's returning home after the Trojan War, while Penelope waited for him. But the Odyssey is just as much a story of Telemachus, the son of Odysseus and Penelope. It's the story of his coming of age and how he matured from boy to man. And that process starts in the first book when Penelope comes down from her private quarters in the Great Hall, and she asks a poet who's performing there in the palace to sing a different tune. And Telemachus intervenes. He chimes in. He says, mother, go back up into your quarters and take up your own work, the loom and the distaff. Speech will be the business of men, all men, and of me most of all, for mine is the power in this household. He was 15 at this point in the story. And what does Penelope do when Telem Tele Telemachus tells her to go back upstairs and take up her own work? She goes and she shuts up. Um, and it's been 3,000 years that women have been interrupted, and it's time to confront those interruptions. Psychological and linguistic research has shown that gender plays a significant role in interruptions. In group conversations or in one-on-one -on -one conversations, in social or professional contexts, women are disproportionately interrupted by both men and by women. And no, this is not because women are more talkative. That's a common misperception. Men actually use more words on average per day than women do. Instead, interruptions are commonly interpreted as attempts by speakers to maximize their power through verbal dominance. And so men interrupt women more because our society has historically accepted male dominance. I'm gonna go back to that empirical study of Supreme Court justices during oral argument. Um, this was a study from 04 to, to, to 15, which was the um, a John Roberts court. Um, over the period of, of, of this study, women made up either 22 or 33% of the bench. I say either or. So from 04 to 2010, there were two female justices, O'Connor and Ginsburg. From 2010 to 2015, there were three female justices, Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan. Um, 32% of all of the interruptions on the record, and these are recorded, these are audio recordings of the oral argument at SCOTUS, 32% of the interruptions were of the female justices. 4% of the interruptions were by the female justices. Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan were each interrupted more than 100 times by their colleagues. And yes, they were also interrupted by the male litigants who were presenting oral argument before the court. Female justices were more than three times more likely to be, inter to be interrupted than their male colleagues were. And the same pattern held true in previous years. There were fewer interruptions from, 99, for, from 1990 to 2002. It's because it was the Rehnquist Court and he ran court a little differently than John Roberts does. It's not a criticism, it's just a, a fact. Um, but Justices O'Connor and Ginsburg, who were the two women on the court um, during that time period, were still interrupted just under three times more likely than the average male justice. I wanna draw your attention to this stat. Notice, that the more women on the bench caused more interruption. That's disheartening. That means that even if we do achieve parity in terms of representation or leadership, there is indication in the research that male aggressiveness to tamp down female communication will increase, even with our increased numbers and, and, and representation. There's a citation to that study. Usually I make a joke about having my text bot cover, cover Justice Kavanaugh, but I don't know. I, I'll, I'll, I'll let it linger there. So this is what leads to a catch-22. Women in the courtroom are confronted with an additional burden that is not faced by men. It's what's been called the Goldilocks dilemma, that a woman who displays traits of a, long, of a strong leader may be seen as strident or unlikable, but a woman who displays traits that are more traditionally feminine risks being seen as lack, lacking in confidence and potential leadership. Men speak, the male register has a tendency to maintain status distinctions. 
And because law is so male dominated, male traits are the norm. That's the preferred style of speech. So here's the catch 22. The female register is seen as weak. That tentative, hyper polite, indirect language is seen as weak and lacking in competence and confidence. But when women adopt the male register and present more assertively, more directly, with more imperative sentences, they're punished for that too because they're seen as, you know the word, bitchy. You're damned if you do, and damned if you don't. I love this cartoon, but when a woman has someone's head cut off, she's a bitch. Even if I'm adopting the male register while doing it, because I don't want to appear weak as I say it. There's one more study to prove the point. This was a study of nearly 700 people who watched video recordings of a male attorney and a female attorney presenting the same, the identical, verbatim closing argument in a particularly gruesome homicide case. And the study participants, <clears throat> excuse me, after watching the videos were asked whether they would hire the lawyers. And the participants used positive aspects of the angry closings to justify, and, and, and I, I should mention that the attorneys were instructed to deliver this, this closing argument that was verbatim. The transcript was word for word on either side, but they were instructed to deliver it in an angry tone, in an aggressive tone. And so the participants who watched the recordings used the positive aspects of the angry closings to justify hiring the male lawyers, they said, sounded uh, assertive and confident and on his game, but they referred to the negative aspects of anger to justify not hiring the female lawyers. So the female lawyers who showed anger in these closing statements, in these closing arguments, were deemed to be less confident, shrill, grating, ineffective, and what's my favorite word, hysterical. There's the citation for that study, which makes us wonder, should we in advocacy education be teaching women to interrupt? The universal principles of effective communication taught in most communication courses, directness, simplicity, forcefulness, are, from an intercultural perspective, American and male. So respectfully, I won't teach women to interrupt because it reinforces the sexist paradigm of having women adopt and adapt to the expectations of the forum. Plus, it has a blowback effect. The other part of the catch-22 is that women who do adopt the male register are punished for that, too, and, and again, seen as that B word. So what can we do to start to shift this paradigm and start to eliminate this gendered communication? Number one, I submit quitting it with this apologist language. Read your transcripts. Go back and read transcripts of yourselves at trial, at depositions, at other recorded hearings, and pay attention to your tone and any use of submissive language, that indirect, hyper-polite, affiliative, hedging language. Like, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I've, I've done it myself, and I've read my own transcripts, and I am appalled by how many times I've said, no, I'm sorry if I missed this, but if I could ask you, and if you wouldn't mind, if you could flip to page two, so only apologize when there's a need to apologize. Um, I, I love these these um, two uh, tweets from, from Women's History Month last year. One thing we're not doing this year is ending sentences with, if that makes sense and if that's okay. You make sense. Your question makes sense and it's perfectly valid. I don't know if that makes sense. It comes from a woman who just made perfect sense. Sorry if this is a stupid question. It's said by a brilliant woman asking an imperf a perfect, perfectly valid and brilliant question. And if you're sure it's not too much trouble, is a fair woman who just made a fair request. So please pay attention to your tone and any submissive language that you have perhaps gotten into the, into the habit of employing. And in that same study about the Supreme Court justices, that empirical study of the oral arguments, it was during the polite and tentative framing of the question when, when um, Justices O'Connor and Ginsburg and Kagan would say things like, Sorry to interrupt. Could I ask? May I ask? It was during those hedging periods of the question that the female justices were most often interrupted by the male justices. That same study found that the more senior female justices, again, O'Connor, Ginsburg, and Kagan, through their tenure, transitioned from a more tentative style of speech 
to a more masculine, aggressive style of questioning, which resulted in fewer interruptions because they got right to their question and didn't give their male colleagues an opportunity to, to interrupt during that hedging phase. I'd also suggest practicing volubility. Volubility is the quality of talking fluidly and readily. That means eliminating that tentative hedging. Um, I will say I have a, a colleague who's not based in Philadelphia. She's down in Florida. She does mass tort uh, litigation um, on the plaintiff side. Um, uh, she's a, she's a, a gay female. Um, she wears her hair very, very short crop. She's practicing in in Florida um, in in uh, politically fraught areas in, in Florida, I'll say. Um, she, she does not wear skirts or dress suits. She always wears um, flat shoes and pants and pants suits. Um, and she knew, I have to, I, I tell this story because she knew that um, how she presents um, would have an effect or could have an effect on her advocacy in front of certain jurors uh, where she practices in Florida. And she told me a, this brilliant story that I fell, I fell in love with. And she said when she did cut her hair very, very short, um, the very first thing she said in jury selection, and she said it rhetorically, she didn't actually ask a, a juror to respond. Um, but she said, do you like my haircut? Because my mama don't like it. And she said, I practiced that line saying that question about a thousand times in the mirror because I wanted the jurors to realize that I knew what they were thinking about me and I wanted to put it out there, but I needed to be fluid. I needed to be voluble when I was asking them that question. They needed to see the ease with which I delivered that question because that communicated an ease and a comfort with myself. So do you like my haircut? Cause my mama don't like it. Uh, and she literally practiced it in the mirror for about a, a, about a thousand times. Um, so practice volubility and practice getting that um, quality of fluidity and, and um, ready speech. Another thing we're doing is confronting interruptions. Also make sure that you're not interrupting. Um, it's just professional courtesy. We want to give all counsel, regardless of gender identity, um, the opportunity to finish a thought and, and have our arguments based on, on the weight and the merit of them and not who talks loudest and, and longest. Um, so confronting interruptions, I, I add this meme, again, not as political commentary, but just because I think this interruption was handled so perfectly. It was two words. I'm speaking. VP Harrison didn't even, even need to say, um, I haven't finished my thought. Please let me continue. Please let me finish what I'm saying. I'm speaking. That's all it takes. And we have to confront interruptions because once someone has been interrupted, they are more likely to remain silent longer than someone who hasn't. So there creates a muscle memory in being silenced and being silent. So we do need to confront interruptions both on, on a personal level for ourselves and for our colleagues, our, our fellow members of the bar. My third um, suggestion, my third best practice would be to practice power posing. What in the heck does that mean? Professor Moravian, in a study from the early 90s, suggests that only about 7% of our communication is sent through words. It's only about 7% that's verbal, and the remaining 93% is sent through nonverbal expressions, about 55% through facial expressions, body language and gestures, and about 38% through tone of voice and inflection, modulation, pitch, pace, things like that. Um, that there's consistent findings that um, in other studies that say that um, about 60 to 93 percent of each message is communicated non-verbally. And language is highly dependent on and intertwined with non-verbal communication, which demonstrates that when faced with a conflicting verbal and non-verbal message, people are five times more likely to believe the non-verbal message. So when I smile and say, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that birthday party I have to take my kids to this weekend, right? The words that are coming out of my mouth are the verbal message. But you can tell by the pacing with which I say it, my facial expressions, 
the, the tone of voice that I use, the hesitancy, all of that goes into my nonverbal communication. And you believe the nonverbal part of my message. You know that by me, even, even though I'm saying, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that, that all of my nonverbal communication is telling you that I'm really, really not. Um, and, and that is the, the part of the message that your listeners will, will um, be more receptive to and will um, uh, uh, latch on to, so to speak. So we can consider communication with two components, gender and with body pose. The associations between men and dominant words and dominant posing remains very strong, as does the association between women and submissive words and submissive posing. However, men have much less flexibility in terms of using non-stereotypical body language. What does that mean? Men are typically seen as being very physically strong, open, the, the shoulders are broad, they stand akimbo, sometimes with their hands on their hips, their feet hip width apart, and women have a tendency to be closed off, to cross our arms, to protect our necks, because it's been millennia that we've been systematically strangled, so, so anthropologically we have this need to protect our necks or go like this or close ourselves off and protect our internal vital organs. Um, However, when men use submissive posing, like crossing their legs tightly, crossing their arms, doing things like protecting their vital organs or protecting their neck, listeners are much less responsive to the message when it comes from a man who is using counter stereotypical body positioning and body posing. However, women, quote unquote, can get away with it. Women are not punished for using more dominant posing in delivering their message. And in fact, um, they are rewarded because remember, the listener pays more attention to the nonverbal communication than to the words that are emitting from the mouth. So women's counter stereotypical nonverbal performance, using those dominant poses, keeping feet hip width apart, standing, standing strong, standing straight, standing with shoulders back, that nonverbal performance appears to have a greater impact. So when pitting gender and pose together, pose is a powerful predictor of participants' expectation of either dominance or submissiveness. And therefore, for women, pose appears to be one way to counteract faulty status cues, such as gender stereotypes. So we can use our body language um, to subvert existing implicit barriers and implicit bias. Men, though privileged, have less flexibility in how they can use their counter, counter stereotypical nonverbal displays. Um, so what, what do I mean? I want to give you some examples of what I mean. So these examples on the left are submissive displays. So the legs tight together, the hands folded, even the hands being hidden in the in the second picture there from the bottom, the feet crossed, protecting the neck, as I said, closing yourself off, crossing your arms, crossing your legs, protecting your vital organs. Where and these are all submissive poses, whereas the dominant poses are what you see on the left, kind of open, not tightly crossed legs, just crossed knee to ankle. I wouldn't suggest sitting like the second picture in court, but that is also considered a dominant pose um, and hands akimbo, hands on the hip. I actually don't like the akimbo stance, um, but hands down by the sides and open. What I tell my students in, in our advocacy courses is I like um, hand motions that follow the NODS acronym. New, it's neutral, open, defined, and strong. So if you're going to use your hands, if you're going to gesticulate the way I do very frequently, um, I, I would submit just having them open, neutral, but strong at the same time, not just flailing around. Um, so that's what I have on, on body posing. My next tip um, has asterisks next to it because I include it informationally. I still grapple with whether or not um, this is something we should employ in, in advocacy education or, or in training new, new and young lawyers. Um, practice gender judo. So, um, Professor Romy may know um, uh, another professor from um, from the University of California in Hastings, Joan Williams, who advises women um, women lawyers to quote survey the climate to determine whether there will be backlash for assertiveness or other traits traditionally perceived as masculine. If the answer is yes, Williams advises using this strategy um, known as gender judo, um, and and she suggests taking um, 
uh, one effective strategy is to combine a hard driving argument with a sense of empathy. So if you're going hard on a witness on cross-examination and it's a very aggressive cross-examination, do we pair that, do we combine that with something that displays our empathy or our support or our um, emotional intelligence in, in approaching a particular witness or, or a, a, a difficult scenario? I submit, I don't think that's gender judo. I think that's effective advocacy because effective advocacy is tailoring communication um, to the listener and being able to modulate and adjust um, to any scenario. So I'm not sure that um, that, that is advice that we wouldn't give male practitioners. Um, so I, I think that being able to pair a hard driving argument with a sense of empathy does cross gender boundaries, but it is, um, it is a suggestion that's in the literature, so I, I include it. Um, next, set boundaries. As we saw from the Forbes study and from the ABA study, if women are more, um, more likely to be the ones doing the party planning or the office organization uh, calendar keeping or even the cleanup um, after office meetings or the, the food ordering for office get-togethers, and set boundaries. Suggest a committee or a schedule of responsibilities. Feel free to decline those housekeeping responsibilities. I will also tell the story. We have um, a very close partnership with um, a, a very large plaintiff firm in Philadelphia with a, a, a very, very good national reputation, and they are very um, generous with their time and their and their resources with our program. Um, but it's, it's ironic because every year when I have guest presenters and guest lecturers from that particular firm, um, I try to be a nice hostess. They're they're lecturing. They're 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 guest presenting for our students. And so you know, can I get you anything? Bottle of water, a cup of coffee. Um, and inevitably, at the end of the presentation every year, the water bottles are left behind on the table. And I stand there having this existential crisis over a water bottle. And I just stare at it and say, Why is it my responsibility to clean up that water bottle? I, I didn't drink from it. I didn't leave it here. It's not my trash. And if I were not a younger female director of this program hosting older male, very accomplished litigators to guest judge, would I be expected uh, to clean up the water bottles or would the inclination to leave the water bottle behind in the first place even be there? Um, so I, I, I grapple with that every year, but I include that as, as a story to set boundaries and to know um, what your responsibilities are and to recognize when um, the, the expectations are being laid upon you in an unfair gender biased way. And um, I encourage you and I hopefully empower you to set those boundaries and say, not doing it, not cleaning up the water bottles anymore and I'm not cleaning up the food after our office meetings. Um, next, I suggest that you learn to brag. The answer to a compliment is thank you, not to demure. It's not to say, oh, it's, it, it was no big deal or it was a team effort. No, if, if you did something, if you accomplished something, if you got a great settlement, if you got a great result from your client, you own that. Um, part of our prescriptive communication is to demure, is to say, oh no, the attention shouldn't be on me. It wasn't that big a deal. Keep a tickler file of your monthly activities and your achievements. I have to say when um, my counterpart on the JD side was, was applying and, and interviewing for her position at Temple, I was on that hiring committee. And I noticed in her resume, she had the, the, the last, my goodness, six, seven pages of her CV were all of the presentations and all of the guests lectures and appearances that she'd made over however many uh, years in her previous position at her previous institution. And I, and I took that and I owned it. And I said, that is a fantastic tickler file. And it's a reminder, not only to myself of all of the appearances and all of the presentations I've done, but also to my employer, because when it's time for me to submit a self-evaluation, when it's time for me to submit my paperwork and in, in hopefully in regards to a merit raise or in regards to a promotion, um, I want them to see all of the things that I do extracurricularly. So make sure that you're keeping that tickler file of all of your achievements so that you can brag about yourself. I also want us to quit it with gendered titles. We're not lady lawyers. 
We're not girl bosses. We're not CEOs or mom entrepreneurs. That's diminutive, reductive language. Let's knock it off with that. We are attorneys. We are members of the bar. We are litigators. We are partners. We are shareholders. We are business owners. Let's not reduce it with gendered titles. Also, I want you to count in rooms. When you find yourself in a position of power or when you're looking at positions of power in your institutions and your organizations and your firms, count the number of women. If you see 30% or fewer women on the board speaking at a day-long conference, authoring articles in a publication in your state or national legislature, on your faculty, in positions of leadership, that's unequal. That's not parity. When you see that, I urge you to speak. Email whoever is putting on the event or who's choosing the members or the speakers or the leaders. If you're on that panel or faculty or board or if you write for that publication, speak up. And of course, the same idea is just as true and just as important when it comes to racial diversity. The only way this world gets more equal and more fair is if we notice when it isn't and then we act. And I have a suggestion for our male colleagues too, and I don't know if any are listening, but ask who's presenting at a conference before you accept a position on a panel. Um, if there are less than 30% of the feature, if, if less than 30% of featured speakers or panelists are female, I might suggest seating your spot and suggesting a female presenter in your place in the hopes of achieving parity. Um, so count in rooms. I gave a training once for newly elected judges in Harrisburg. This was when I was still at the DA's office and I was sitting in, in a room where lunch was served and we were all sitting at, you know, those round 60 inch tables that they have in, in banquet halls. And uh, I counted and there were 56 people in the room. 53 of them were men. I was one of the women, um, a female, newly elected female judge was sitting next to me. And then the, the administrator, the uh, administrative person for um, the judicial conference was, um, was also female. And we were sitting together at a table and I said, I was kind of ruminating, and I said out loud, this is a room full of men. And the administrator looked up from her meal. She was eating. We were eating lunch. And she looked up and she said, huh, I never noticed that. Count in room and draw attention to it when there's not parity. If you see something, say something. Um, judge Tim Rice was a federal magistrate judge. He retired, I think, last year from the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. And he wrote a wonderful um, opinion. It was his last published opinion where um, he reminded the uh, parties in, in a case, um, in a petition for attorney's fees. There was a petition for almost $850,000 in attorney's fees. And there was a male shareholder who served as a consultant and a female shareholder who was lead trial counsel. And then there was a female partner. And the female partner, excuse me, the female shareholder um, had been practicing law for fewer years um, than the female partner. Um, and her performance would warrant her a, a rate, whatever it was, um, of less than what the female partner with more years experience would have earned just based on her um, years of experience. And Judge Rice wrote this opinion and said that even though the CLS fee schedule serves as a useful guide on setting hourly rates, its reference to experience should not serve as a cap that precludes exceptionally talented trial lawyers from receiving fair compensation simply because of age or gender. Um, you are the leaders in this profession, or you will be. So make sure that you know what your value is and that female attorneys who come after you know what their, what their value is. So it's on us to set the record straight when, when sexism rears its ugly head. And I think that Judge Rice was attempting to do that in this final opinion. Also, I'd suggest when the opportunities arise, change the narrative. The American Bar Association um, took pains a couple summers ago to distance itself from a recent article um, that criticized women lawyers for prioritizing family life after having children. There was an article by a Susan Smith Blakely who was a career counselor and former law firm partner who described motherhood as a game changer that can cause very busy women lawyers to, quote, lose focus. And to succeed at a high level in law, Blakely wrote, um, mothers must be willing to be, quote, team players 
and make time for success in their professional lives as well as their personal lives. And so the ABA, who had a female president, um, wrote a letter, and that was also signed by all nine former female ABA presidents. And they wrote that Blakely's opinions are antithetical to the core beliefs and principles of the American Bar Association. Um, they wrote the lack of upward mobility by women in the profession is not because women are not putting in the time and effort, nor is it because they're distracted by other concerns in their lives. But she cited two systemic issues that need to be faced head on when it comes to the promotion and retention of female attorneys. But remember, even if we achieve parity, a culture shift is required. So as I said, the more women who joined the bench on the Supreme Court, the male justices interrupted the female justices at an increased rate. Men may react against women entering their domain by increasing their aggressiveness toward women. Social science research shows us that diversity trainings and certain do's and don'ts lists, and I appreciate the irony of my 10 best practices, are ineffective. Instead, we legal educators and those in, in leadership positions need to teach male and female lawyers that language can be versatile, creative, and context rich. Um, it, language is a strategy for achieving transactional relationship, relational and transformative goals of the profession, of your organization, for your clients. We do need to disturb the universe, to quote the chocolate war. Um, the male register shouldn't be the only one employed or given credence one size does not fit all, but put it in terms of the client or the goals of the case you're trying. All practitioners should be trained and supported in recognizing and assessing the value, if any, of communication norms within our organization and then encouraging them to try other linguistic styles to see if they may serve them better in terms of legal leadership and effective advocacy. But finally, and I realize I'm reaching my time, the best practice of all, truly, to be yourself. I quote to Professor Kenji Yoshino's book covering all the time. Professor Yoshino is a con law professor at NYU. He's previously at Yale. He graduated Yale Law School and Harvard undergrad. Um, and and he, he says here that this is the desire, authenticity. This is the desire for authenticity, our common human wish to express ourselves without being impeded by unreasoning demands for conformity. So I pledge to teach authenticity, to encourage it, to nurture it, and to speak up on behalf of my students and colleagues when a sexist expectation occurs. But when we talk about authenticity, this is something I talk about a lot, and I draw a lot of um, inspiration and guidance from a professor named Herminia Barra, um, who's a business professor, a, a, again, a, a Yale PhD and a business professor at the London School of Business. I think we've been missing the mark when it comes to teaching and encouraging authenticity. Um, so Professor Ibarra teaches on authenticity and reviews several perhaps unhelpful ways that we think about authenticity, which may jeopardize our capacity to grow and to learn. So when I suggest that we eliminate some of our indirect affiliative language, that language that's associated with the female register or that we confront or interruptions or that we change the narrative, you might say that's a great suggestion, but that's just not my style. That's not how I talk. That's not how I present. And is that authentic? When you say that's just not me, that's not how I talk? Maybe, but that's because that's not how you're used to speaking or presenting when in changing the narrative or getting rid of that affiliative language. So while that might be true to yourself, maintaining how you talk and how, and how you present and how you always have, it's also being rigid. And it lands us in that catch-22. And so when we say to thine own self, be true, be yourself, which self? Which self are we talking about? Your old self, today's self, your future aspirational self? If it's today's self, does that mean that being authentic condemns you to always being as you've always been? And it prevents you from advancing or learning or trying new things? Of course not. I hope not. Um, but how about another uh, an, another aspect of authenticity? Authenticity, according to Professor Ibarra, a second way that we define authenticity is being sincere. In other words, saying what you mean and meaning what you say. And as it turns out, the word sincere has a really interesting origin. It comes from two Latin words: sine, meaning without, and cera, meaning wax. And that together means without wax. The phrase comes from ancient Rome, where it was a common practice for statue merchants to hide flaws in their statues with wax. 
and the more scrupulous merchants, the ones who didn't want to be dishonest with their customers, would hang a sign outside their shop saying, Fina Chera, without filler, without wax. So for my student at the beginning of this presentation, he said, Marion, Professor, you just don't understand. I can't not thank the judge. His respectfulness was sincere and presenting anything else was like filler. It was wax. It wasn't him. But we're advocates and we have an objective to meet for our clients, for our organizations and for ourselves. We all know the first principle of effective communication is tailoring it to your audience. So whether you're new to it or not comfortable with it, you might insist that that new form of communication is just not you, it's filler, it's insincere. And that's the classic example of what Professor Ibarra calls the authenticity paradox. It's when you find yourself facing a choice between being yourself and doing what it takes to be effective. You need to pick one or the other. And the paradox is that you want to be successful, you want to have more impact, but you're reticent to trying something that might feel insincere. And that fear, that reluctance, just as much as gendered communication bias, is going to keep you from achieving your goals and making an impact. So Professor Ibarra suggests an experimental approach to the pursuit of authenticity, one where you can try on different styles of speaking, of communication style, of interpersonal relationships, and you can see how they feel and if they lead to success. She tells us that the word authenticity comes from the Greek word autenteo, which originally meant that which you do with your hands. Humanistic psychologists don't see authenticity as a trait, something you either have or you don't, but rather authenticity is the outcome of a process of becoming your own person. It's that lifelong process of learning about yourself. So remember, learning means doing things practicing styles of speech and communicating in ways that don't feel very comfortable to you. And that's okay because you don't know how to do it yet if you haven't been practicing in that regard. So find the courage. I encourage you to find the courage to seek discomfort, to celebrate the thing that sets you apart in any room you're in. Be playful with your sense of self. Experiment and try things out. And if it doesn't work, you try something else instead. Um, but you don't have to commit to being any one person, any one style, any one register of speech. I'm here to encourage hysteria. Um, I don't know if my sound is going to work in, in this clip. It might work for me. I don't know if it'll work for you. Um, you can see the, the subtitles there. If we dream of equal opportunity, we're delusional. When we're too good. There's something wrong with us. When we're too good, there's something if wrong with us. Angry, if we get angry, angry, we're hysterical, irrational, or just being crazy. A woman running a marathon. A woman running a marathon was crazy. A woman boxing was crazy. A woman dunking was crazy. Coaching an NBA team, competing in a hijab, or winning 23 Grand Slams, having a baby, then coming back for more. Crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. So if they want to call you crazy, fine. Show them what crazy can do. It's only crazy till you do it. So maybe I didn't end sexism in the last 71 minutes, and I apologize for that. But the fact remains, who run the world? Girls. Um, shameless plug. I am the director of the LLM and Trial Advocacy. Check us out online. Um, and if you have any questions or comments, I'm happy to, to stay on. Uh, I am three hours ahead of you. I'm a little tired, but it's okay. I will. Um, but there's all my contact information. Please do feel free to reach out. I'd love to hear your feedback or your comments or your questions. Email or um, telephone numbers is, is provided there. Um, and that's all I have for tonight.